Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have a lot to cover today, from SpaceX making huge strides with Starship development and the completion of Boca Chica Tower 2, while Blue Origin faced New Glenn setbacks and Rocket Factory Augsburg suffered a catastrophic failure of their RFA-1 first stage during hot fire testing. Additionally, Boeing was dealt a devastating blow as NASA announced that it was not confident that Starliner is safe for crew return and as such will need SpaceX's Crew Dragon to rescue Butch and Sonny. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. SpaceX are getting ready to make history with Starship Flight 5, where they will be attempting to recover Super Heavy by landing it into Mechazilla's catch arms, whereupon it will be hypothetically able to be restacked, refueled, and reflown. In a show of support for the booster, Ship 30, the vehicle's upper stage, has been decked out with a little Mechazilla decal. But this is a purely supportive decal. SpaceX will not be attempting to recover the ship this time, or for the foreseeable future, to be honest, and instead will once again attempt attempt to simply have it re-enter successfully and do an SN15 style flip, burn and splash down in the ocean just like Ship 29 managed, though hopefully with the flap staying a little less melted. The area you can see becoming molten on Ship 29 has received significant improvements to its heat shielding for Ship 30, hopefully meaning the flap will be more resilient to the heat of re-entry. The chopsticks have been on the receiving end of near continuous work in the build-up to the launch. Interestingly, we recently saw workers remove all three dampening bumper blocks from the inner walls of the arms. Is this for inspection or replacement purposes? It's unclear right now. SpaceX have been doing extensive tests of the catch arms with test tank B14.1, and it was recently rolled back to the build area, where it remained to be seen if it would be used for any more tests. It looks like it will in fact be used for more testing though, as teams appeared to install two low point arms to the vehicle, meaning that it's very likely we'll be seeing more testing with this tank ahead of Flight 5. I really hope the launch tower isn't destroyed by the booster being off target and not being able to divert, but if it is, we are a major step closer to completion of the second launch complex. While we're still a very long way from operations, the tower is now at full height. The ninth and final segment was stacked last week. If it feels like we went from one to two towers in very little time, then that's because it's true. Incredibly, the construction of Tower 2 has taken just 41 days. In exciting future vehicle news, we saw the aft section of Ship 33, the first Starship version 2 vehicle, rolled into the Mega Bay. Interestingly, not sporting much heat shielding at this stage. The door was then closed, but not for long. It was then opened, giving us a full view of Ship 33 being raised above the new aft section, where the two parts were then lifted onto the turntable for welding. NASA Spaceflight's Jack Byer captured this excellent top-to-bottom shot of the vehicle, which most notably differs from Starship version 1 by having smaller and more leeward forward flaps. Raptor 3 looks to have conducted another static fire test, captured by NASA Spaceflight's McGregor Live. The static fire lasted 169 nice seconds, which would be a simulation of a full duration burn for a super heavy launch. SpaceX launched just the one Falcon 9 last week from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. This was Starlink Mission 10-5 and saw the rocket carry 22 Starlink V2 minis to low Earth orbit last Tuesday. After stage separation, the rocket's first stage made a successful landing on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, marking this first stage's first ever landing. Yes, it's not often we see brand new Falcon 9 boosters flying and I'm looking forward to seeing this one fly many more times to come. The only other orbital launch we saw last week was a nighttime launch of a Chinese Long March 7A, which carried the Chinasat 4A communication satellite to geosynchronous orbit last Thursday. It'll provide voice, data, radio and television transmission services for China SATCOM, a former subsidiary of China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, which is essentially China's version of America's NASA. Tomorrow is going to be a pretty big day for Falcon 9. It's the launch of Polaris Dawn, which will become the first ever crewed mission to conduct a spacewalk from Dragon and will fly humans higher in Earth's orbit than anyone since Apollo. The mission will also test laser-based Starlink communications and conduct research to help 
provide insight on human health during long-duration spaceflight missions, according to SpaceX. So far, the weather is looking go for launch, so tune in next week where I'll be able to cover the launch properly. Hit subscribe and ring the bell so you get notified of that video. One of the upcoming launches I am super excited about is the maiden flight of Rocket Factory Augsburg's RFA-1 rocket. Because I'm European and I love to see my continent developing rockets, but mainly because it'll be launching from the UK and will be our first ever vertical orbital rocket launch. The rocket's first stage has been vertical at the Saxaford spaceport in the Shetland Islands, awaiting its first launch in the coming weeks. But there's been a setback. The first stage has gone. Last Monday, RFA plans to hotfire all nine engines on the first stage for the first time for a total of 35 seconds before propellant depletion. However, things didn't go to plan. After igniting eight of the motors, one of them experienced an unusual fault, most likely a fire in the LOX turbo pump, which rapidly spread to the other engines. The fire caused significant damage to the propellant manifolds, such that they continued feeding kerosene out of the vent lines and by this stage nothing could be done and the fire's intensity continued to rise, described by RFA as an oxygen fire, destroying the aft portion of the stage, leading to complete collapse of the vehicle. Unfortunately, both the CO2 and water fire suppression systems were inadequately powerful to handle the inferno. The loss of the vehicle obviously means that the launch this year is off the cards, but happily, the rocket collapsed away from critical infrastructure. And aside from some scorch marks, the launch pad and infrastructure is essentially undamaged, aside from the direct support structures. Despite the catastrophic nature of the engine failure, RFA has fired the Helix engine over 100 times and they have never seen an oxygen fire in the turbo pumps before, and so they're confident that this anomaly doesn't represent a need to overhaul the engine's design. It's also worth noting that this is RFA's first ever first stage, and they already have the second first stage in their workshop, which features over 100 improvements to the vehicle, mostly related to propellant manifolds and pressurization systems, and the launch pad will see upgrades to its fire suppression system so that if a fire like this happens again, loss of the vehicle shouldn't happen. And the second and third stage, and the rocket's fairings, are all still ready for integration with the first stage in the Shetland Islands. No hard and fast date has been set for launch with the new first stage, but RFA have stated that they hope the timeline to be relatively quick. I think the best thing to make of this situation though is the incredible level of communication and transparency RFA have demonstrated here. It would be amazing if we saw the same level of transparency from others. On a totally unrelated note, Boeing! Ah, Boeing, the news that we were all kind of expecting for a while now has finally arrived. NASA has decided that Butch and Sonny will return with Crew-9 next February, uh, and that Starliner uh, will return uncrewed. Dealing another crushing blow to the aerospace giant's already faltering reputation. Originally planned for 2017, Starliner's first crewed flight carried Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams to the International Space Station for a roughly eight-day mission about three months ago. The prolonged stay, as you're all probably aware of by now, was due to multiple malfunctions with the spacecraft, including helium leaks and the outage of five of the eight aft-facing RCS thrusters while approaching the station. Extensive tests and investigations have been conducted on the safety of the spacecraft's ability to return its crew back to Earth, but despite Boeing's best efforts, NASA has now officially announced that Butch and Sonny will be rescued by a SpaceX Crew Dragon, deeming Starliner too risky. This is especially humiliating for Boeing because Crew Dragon has been a resounding success and SpaceX were awarded half the budget Boeing were given. Not only this, but when the contracts for commercial crew were first being proposed, there was a massive effort to make Boeing the only contractor. There was a big push to block SpaceX from being given the opportunity to provide crew transport for NASA astronauts. And now they'll be rescuing the crew from a billions over budget and seven years late and still not able to do its job capsule. I'm fascinated to see what happens with Starliner next. I highly doubt the contract will be pulled, after all Flight 2 was a success, but it remains to be seen if NASA will want another uncrewed test flight before allowing astronauts to fly aboard Starliner again. I've put a link in the description to an excellent Twitter post by Steve Jovetson that features some excerpts from Eric Berger's forthcoming book Reentry, and the quotes from astronauts and NASA figures are quite harrowing in the context of how Starliner eventually played out. 
The issue though is that we still don't know if the Starliner can safely undock from the ISS and get clear of it. If the thrusters fail, it could end up colliding with the station, causing catastrophic damage. There are no grapple points on the spacecraft for the Canadarm to unberth it either, and we don't have a Jebediah Kerman on board to go on EVA and give it a push either. In a worst case scenario, the international docking adapters on the station have pyrotechnic bolts for emergency undocking in the event of hook disengagement failure, but the use of these could permanently disable the docking port, so it's unlikely these will be used. We'll have to wait and see what happens as this story develops. This also means that SpaceX Crew-9 will not be flying with its planned crew of four, instead just two, to make space for Butch and Sunny on the way back. Which two people will be kicked off the mission isn't yet known. It's unlikely to be Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov, due to NASA's crew rotation agreements with Roscosmos. His crewmate on Dragon will either be NASA astronauts Zena Cardman, Nick Haig, or Stephanie Wilson. I am sure NASA will announce the new crew roster in the next few days, if they haven't done so by the time you're watching this video. There was another setback in the space industry last week. Bloomberg reported that Blue Origin experienced a factory mishap that crumpled the upper portion of a rocket while being moved to a storage hangar, and another incident that saw an upper rocket portion fail and explode during stress testing. It has been noted that there were no injuries during either episode, but otherwise very little concrete information is known. Julia Bergeron of NASA Spaceflight happened to drive past the Blue Origin campus and saw that the door on the 2CAT building is absent, indicating that this could have been where the failed test took place. Last Wednesday, NASA transported a critical piece of hardware for the SLS rocket that will be used in Artemis 2, the first crewed mission of Artemis. The cone-shaped launch vehicle stage adapter was rolled out from the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and was shipped off to Florida. This piece connects the SLS core stage to its upper stage, protecting the engine of the upper stage. It's currently aboard NASA's Pegasus barge, and en route to Florida, it'll stop off at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans to pick up more SLS hardware before continuing to Kennedy. Once it arrives, it'll be prepared for stacking with the recently delivered core stage in the Vehicle Assembly Building. If you enjoyed this video, then I make space news content every Monday, and Kerbal Space Program videos every Saturday. My last Kerbal outing took us to the moon on a shoestring budget. Literally, we had to fly a rocket held together with string, duct tape, and cardboard, thanks to drastic cuts to our space agency's funding. This was a fun mission showcase of the Bargain Rocket Parts mod, and so if it sounds like a fun time, then click that card on screen to check it out, and also please consider supporting the show by joining my Patreon, like the good folk on the left did. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Space This Week, and I'll see you all next time.